Our scripture this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. And I might go a little further than that, so you'll have to listen to that part because I doubt you're going to understand me. Then Paul stood in front of the ear of the Oropagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. God who is the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed anything, since God gave to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, God made all the nations to inhabit the whole earth, and God allotted the times in their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God, and perhaps grope for God and find God, though indeed God is not far from each one of us. For in God we live and move and have our being, and even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent. Because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom God has appointed. And of this, God has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them scoffed. But others said, we'll hear, we'll hear again about this from you. At that point, Paul left them. The church is dying. You know, young people are just leaving the church in droves. People these days, they're, they're spiritual. They're not religious. And then, of course, the biggest worrying cry of them all, millennials. <laughs> I'm sure we've all heard, maybe some of us have even said, some of these things, especially when we're trying to diagnose what's happening, what's going wrong with the state of the church. I mean, it makes sense that we say these things, think these things, definitely hear these things, because we're concerned. We're worried. We care about the church. It's something that means a lot to many of us. You know, I know there was a time when I thought very seriously about leaving the church. In fact, when I was first in college, I basically did. I spent a lot of time away from church. I, I considered myself spiritual, but not religious. I didn't trust organized religion. I'd seen too many people that I cared about get hurt by it. I had seen too many hypocritical things that the church was doing or that Christians were doing in the church's name. And I thought, maybe there's something else better that I can find to fill my spiritual needs than Christianity. Of course, I came back because there were things that the church had, that organized religion had, that did speak to me and that I needed. And I had a much better relationship growing up with the church than a lot of young people have had. So it was easier for me to forgive some of the misgivings that I see, still see in a lot of people who claim they represent the church. But that isn't everyone's experience. That isn't everyone's, in everyone's ability to be able to just forgive and come back. You all know I love television. Um, this week on Friday, season three of a Netflix show came out, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Any of you know about Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? A few of you are nodding. So, 
Kimmy Schmidt, this is now the third season. Tina Fey, who did 30 Rock and was on Saturday Night Live, it's, it's her show. She writes it and created the show. Um, and the premise of the show is, this is the very first part of season one, is there are these women who have been, for numbers of years, convinced by this, this crazy um, cult leader that the world has ended, and so he's locked these women in a bunker. Well, the very beginning of the show, the FBI has found out about this and has saved the women from the bunker. And Kimmy Schmidt is the main character, and she's one of these Indiana Bowl women, is what they call them, because they lived all these years in a bunker. So the show is really about her trying to live in the real world when she's been locked in a bunker since she was a middle schooler. So she hasn't really experienced the world. And so the show, it's a comedy, <laughs> despite that kind of horrific premise. The show is a comedy because it's about Kimmy's inability to interact with the world. Well, in season three, um, she kind of meets this guy that she get, becomes friends with, because she's wanting to go to college now. And um, he's studying philosophy, and he's decided he's going to go to divinity school. And she's like, divinity school? What, are you going to get powers? Like, magical powers? And he's like, no, no, I'm going to become a reverend. And so she punches him, throws a trash can at him, because her experience with Reverend is the guy who locked her in a bunker for 15 years. And so, you know, finally, in episode 9, the title is Kimmy Goes to Church. Episode 9 of season 3, and she decides she needs to experience, maybe there's more to church than her experience with church. Hilarious episode, and at first it really makes it seem like it's going to show kind of some of the nastiness that exists with church. Because we know that's out there. There are church bullies, there are hypocritical Christians, and it seems that's where the episode is going. And I'm like, you know, maybe we deserve this. But that's not where the episode ends up going. It ends up showing really some of the great stuff about church and what's important about church. And I found myself both laughing and kind of crying because I was like, wow, it's very rare that you get a mainstream comedy that really shows you some truth about church. One of the moments that I love is when Kimmy's inside and she sees the board of all the outreach projects and mission projects that the church is doing. She's like, wow, they're doing a lot of good for people. And hopefully, as church, that's what we should be doing. And in the end, when Kimmy tries to call out the hypocrisy that she sees and the people in the church applaud her for calling out that hypocrisy and admit to their own hypocrisy and say, we know that we're these things. And we're trying to be better because that's what Christianity is about is that we know we're not perfect and we know those around us aren't perfect but we're here together trying to be better people and it's a powerful episode and also I love the fact that Kimmy's really shocked when the minister comes up and it's a woman <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a great episode and it's a great show and I really, it really spoke to me, especially this episode, that hey, yeah, that's what church should be. But the truth is, we can't just expect people who've left the church, or never been to church, or have really been hurt by church, to just randomly wander into a church. And honestly, there are probably a few churches where I hope they don't. So what do we do? Do we give up on them? These are hard questions. They're without concrete answers. I'm not going to solve the problem <laughs> of young people leaving the church or people who've left the church this morning in the sermon. It's not my goal, and I don't think I could, even if it was my goal. But there are some things I know that are true in my mind that I think might be helpful. One, the church isn't going anywhere. The church is going to be around. There's still going to be a church. It might not be what we've always known as church. It might not be recognizable to us as the church that we grew up in. But I guarantee you, God is going to have something in the world that is working in the world to bring about what God wants to happen. And folks, that's church. Phyllis Tickle is a theologian who, who's written about 
the changes in church. And she's noticed something. About every 500 years, the church goes under radical changes. So we have around 2,000 years ago, Jesus. Right? That's a pretty radical change in Judaism and what had been going on to now this birth of Christianity. Well, about 400 years after that, Constantine, the Roman emperor, decides that he's Christian. And out of that, all of a sudden, there's this state sponsorship of Christianity. And if you don't think that changed the church, it absolutely did. There was, it went from people having to hide their religion to being able to be out and about with it. Ultimately, I mean, there's, there's good, there's, there's probably some problems in the fact that we got state sponsorship as well, because part of what early Christianity was really about was about being worried about this power structure between those who were in charge and everybody else. And some of that focus went away when those who were in charge were behind Christianity. So we had that around 400, about the year 1000 or so in there, 900 to 1000, I'm not sure exact dates, but we have the split between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. And that's a pretty big change as well. Then, I do know the date on this one, in 1517, October 30th, 1517, in other words, we're coming up on the 500th year anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of a church in Germany. And that was a big part of the Protestant Revolution. Protestantism was exactly born 500 years ago. In other words, we're due. There's going to be something that really changes what the church is. The church isn't going anywhere, but it's going to look different. Two, my second truth. I think people are looking for ways, all people, lots of people, old people, young people, people who are religious or spiritual but not religious, people who are religious, people who aren't spiritual or religious, are looking for ways to get involved in their community. They're looking for ways to help others. They're looking for ways to do service projects. Or those who are more spiritual or religious might use the words to do mission work, to do outreach. People are looking for ways to get involved. And really, that's what the church should be focused on and doing anyway. So maybe there's a connection there that we can make. And finally, the third thing I know that I know to be true is that if your main concern, if your end goal is finding numbers, filling seats, worrying about attendance, then you're going to fail. You're not going to, you're not going to achieve that goal. If that's your goal, it's not going to work. Because I think the last thing that anybody is looking for is wanting to be sought after to just be another butt in the seat. To just be another number. I mean, how personal does that feel? And yeah, that's not what we mean when we say we'd like more people in the pews, but that's certainly how it feels if that's our goal in bringing people in to the people. Like, they're just looking for more numbers. They're not looking for connections. They're not looking for people. They're looking for numbers. Let's take a look at today's scripture. The big, the big point, I love this scripture. It's one of my favorite scriptures. And I'm wearing this stole in part because of this scripture. Paul, in the scripture, he's in Athens. Now, um, you know, 
we've gone through a bit of a change in Greece and Athens aren't as politically powerful as they were a little bit earlier. But they're still really well respected for the thought that goes on there. I mean, it's still got that cachet of, hey, really smart people gather and talk in Athens. And so Paul goes into Athens, and just before our scripture, we see Paul is appalled. Didn't mean that pun there, appalled. Um, just kind of happened. But Paul sees all these idols, literal idols, you know, to all these Greek gods and different gods, and he's, that's, you know, Paul is horrified by this. It would have been really easy, I think, for Paul to preach to the Athenians on how horrible their idolatry problem is. It's not what he does. It's not what he does at all. Instead, <clears throat> Paul looks for a way to connect with them. He uses something they're familiar with, something they're comfortable with, something from their own circumstances that most religious authorities would also recognize as an idol and certainly wouldn't approve of, but Paul congratulates them for it. I see that you are a very religious people. He uses it as a way to connect with them. A lot of times I've done things at camp, things uh, with college groups, things at churches um, where I've used film. Scenes from movies, scenes from comics, scenes from Doctor Who, to talk about religious subjects. And a lot of times before I start that, I start with this scripture. And I'm like, this is something that's in our DNA. We look for the secular to explain the theological. It's something we can do. It's something Paul did. There is God. In that stuff because God is part of everybody who's making that stuff and watching that stuff and talking about that stuff God's there Paul tells us in the scripture God is closer than we think God is with us God isn't in an altar or in a temple or in a church building God's with us among us right There are other ways we can do this. Um, a lot of times I'll, you know, shocking alert, I go to bars sometimes. I'll be at a bar and I'll be drinking and I'll somehow, and I don't know how this happens, but it always seems to happen to me. I find myself in a conversation about scripture or God with somebody. And I didn't plan on going to the bar to get in a theological discussion. Like, probably I was going to watch a hockey game and have a drink and maybe get some, you know, bar food or some nachos or something, but I find myself in conversation with somebody about Scripture. I remember one time in Fort Worth, I was at a bar, and I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden I'm talking with this guy who's a self-proclaimed atheist, and he's telling me all the reasons why he's an atheist and how horrible organized religion is. And his reasoning is all these things about Scripture and the hypocrisy he sees about it, and I'm like... Well, part of the problem is, whoever told you that's what that scripture meant was totally wrong. That's not what that scripture meant. So we get into this hour-long, and I'm not exaggerating, hour-long conversation on the book of Job. And what the book of Job is actually about. And I love the book of Job. Because the book of Job was written because there was somebody who was hearing a lot of people saying, Oh, you're sick? Yeah, what did you do? Maybe your parents did something, but you deserve this. And the writer of Job is like, well, that's crap. That's not true. And so the writer of Job writes this story that's about, hey, sometimes bad things happen to good people. But there is no truth to the fact that if something happens to you, it's because you deserved it. It's not true. The writer of Job wrote the book to disprove what he saw as a very hypocritical and bad theology that was part of his time. That's awesome to me. I love that. 
And so we spent time talking about that. And at the end of the conversation, I don't think the guy was going to run off and join his nearest church. <laughs> but he definitely had a different idea of who might be Christian and what some Christians might think than he had before. You know, I read a little bit beyond what our scripture had because also the scripture shows us it doesn't always work. People scoffed at Paul. He didn't have the success here that he'd been having up to this point in other places. We don't have the church in Athens that Paul starts, like we have the church in Rome that Paul starts and the church in Corinth that Paul starts and the church in, um, I, my mind just totally went blank, but there's lots of them, right? Thessalonica. Um, we, got, we got letters from Paul to all these churches he started, and there were more than just those, but he didn't start one in Athens. He failed. Didn't work. We can't expect to see the results that we might want to see every time. And really, we can't be doing it because we want to see those results or because we want to achieve that those results. That's not why we're doing it. It can't be about numbers or typical Sunday attendance because that's falling in the way the church used to be. That's falling into the way of what that's how we judge success of church in the past. But we know we're at that 500 year point. Church is going to be something different. If we're stuck on looking at how it used to be, then we're stuck in the past. We're stuck in an old system. We don't know what God's planning to do next. But hopefully, we're open to the Spirit. We're looking. We're listening. We're doing the things that we know we're called to do, such as working in the neighborhood, finding needs near us that we can fill, finding ways that we can serve those around us. And putting ourselves out there, meeting people where they are. I went to the Innovate Conference my first week that I was here in Chattanooga that the region put on. And one of my favorite people in the world, Reverend Katie Hayes, who's from Fort Worth, who I knew before I went up to Tulsa, um, was the speaker that first day. And we talked about this a little before, but she talked about it again in her keynote about the idea, we love to say how we welcome everyone. And that's a good thing to do. And at her church, they have, they have little wristbands that say, test our welcome. We'll prove to you how welcoming. But she's starting to think about welcoming in a new way. And the reason is she looked at Hebrews. And in Hebrews 13, it talks about the way that they did sacrifices. The altar was outside. And they would do the sacrifice outside, you know, because they don't want to smoke up the temple or the synagogue. And it said, no, Jesus also suffered outside. Right? They took him outside the city. Golgotha was outside the city. Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people. Hebrews 13, 13. Let us then go to him outside. Let us then go to him outside. That's where it happened. It was outside. If we're trying to bring people in and turn them into who we are, are we really doing what we're called to do? Or are we supposed to go outside to where they are? One of my favorite theologians who's crazy and really difficult to understand is Jacques Derrida, and he talks a lot about hospitality, and he coined a term, hospitality. That hospitality is hostile, if you really think about it. Because somebody comes inside, and you're like, hey, make yourself at home. Now, they say, you know, I really hate where you have your, your silverware. I'm going to move that. <laughs> We're not going to let them move our silverware. Are we really letting them make it their home when they come visit our home? No. No. We need to go where they are. We need to go to what's really their home. If we're going to welcome, 
Let's make themselves feel at home. Let's go to where they are. Let's have them test our welcome. Not worry about trying to force them to fit in with us. The church is changing. If we want to be part of what God is doing in the future, we probably need to change as well. 